Okay, so maybe we can get started. Uh, so welcome everyone. So this is the first CSP seminar of this semester. So for the first seminar, it's our great pleasure to have Professor Jeffrey Fessler to give us a talk. So uh, for many of you here, if you have ever taken X551 uh, or 556, I think you should know Professor Jeffrey Fessler pretty well, right? His, his class is very popular in our, in our department. It's required. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, as many of you, like Professor Jeff Fessler is highly like respected professor in our department. Okay, he's a William Root uh, professor in EECS department, and uh, his research uh, is mainly focused on uh, signal processing, uh, machine learning, and the still cast back of uh, image processing uh, with applications in biomedical like CT, MR, and this bad. Uh, and he has earned many awards, he has many awards. Is, uh, it's a very long list to, to mention, and uh, associate editors of many journals in signal processing and machine learning. Uh, today, he will talk about something very interesting in accelerated optimization for dynamic MR reconstruction with locally low rank regulators. So with that, the room is yours. Okay, Ching, thank you for the introduction. And should we thank our sponsors too? Thank you to KLA uh, yeah. and LGAI for uh, sponsoring yes, the seminar sure. series. <laughs> okay, so this is very much a talk that's about research that's work in progress, uh, work that I've discussed with a number of different collaborators, including a former PhD student, one of our own colleagues, like a postdoc Rodrigo and Javier, a PhD student who've done most of the, made most of the results that I'm gonna actually show you today. Uh, this work has not been submitted anywhere yet. I presented at the SIAM conference, but that doesn't have any proceedings or anything. So, and even though the word dynamic MRI appears in the very first line of the title, um, it's also relevant to other things like uh, robust PCA and so on. So some of the optimization concepts may be useful beyond just dynamic MRI. All right, this is an outline. So the title is about locally low rank methods and I'm gonna get there, but there's a lot of extra notation to describe the locally low rank version. So I'm gonna start by talking about globally low rank models first. And so as you hear that, so it's easier to present that way, but it runs the risk that some of you are gonna say, oh, that's an easy problem, I know how to solve that. And so hold your thought on how easy that is and see if the methods you think you know how to solve for that one will apply to the locally low rank ones, which is where I'm really trying to go with this, okay? And then if you have ideas for that one, I'd love to discuss that with you. All right, so as I speak here, a video is recording this, right? And the sensor in the video, I think it's a reasonable model to say that all the pixels in the sensor are roughly capturing uh, some signal at the same point in time. And we get a sequence of time frames as a function of spatial position. I'm just showing one dimension of spatial position here. Um, so this is dynamic imaging as we know it from our cell phones and laptop cameras and so on. It's not an accurate picture. Of course, there's a time period over which the A to D converter in there is integrating charge. So these really should be rectangles instead of dots. And if I move quickly, then there would be motion blur because of that time integral. But the point is that all the points in space are acquired basically at the same time instant, all right? So that's simple, relatively speaking. In MRI, we don't collect data in spatial domain. We collect data in the spatial frequency domain. So the axis now is what we call K space or reciprocal space, one, uh, cycles per millimeter. And we sample in that space just the way the physics of MRI work. And you will see pictures like this in some papers about dynamic MRI, pretending that at every point in time, we collect a whole bunch of samples at different points in K space, but this is the fantasy. This is not how actual MRI sampling works. It takes time to collect every sample in K space in MRI, and you can only collect one point in time. Even if you have multiple receive coils, which is another story, you can only point, collect one point in K space at a time. So this is a realistic picture in one dimension of what dynamic MRI sampling looks like. Every, every point in case space that you collect takes some amount of time. Time is marching on as you're collecting data. So there's no such thing as a fully sampled dynamic MRI data set because we're always, you can think of this as a big matrix completion problem, right? There's a real, there's a, a, a time axis here and a case space axis here. And we would really like to have every point in this 2D grid available to us, but we never can get that. Uh, so what we do in practice is we take this set of points here in, in traditional practice in clinical MRI or dynamic MRI anyway, take the set of points and we pretend they were all 
collected at the same point in time, just like this fantasy picture here. And we take an inverse FFT and we say that's a picture of what the patient was at that point in time. And then we go on to the next group. Well, I say that point, that interval in time. And then we do that for the next frame and so on. And this is only eight points here. A realistic MRI scan would have a, you know, 2D would be like 128 by 128 points. It takes a long time to collect all that. And the patient will have moved or breathed or the blood will have flown or whatever during that period of time. And we will get motion blur during that acquisition, depending on a lot of timing parameters and details. So to try and improve, and obviously if you want better spatial resolution, you need to go further out in K-space, collect higher points in spatial frequency space. And then you get this fundamental trade-off then between spatial resolution and temporal resolution. If you go further out in K-space, that takes more time before you can start the sweep again and do the next time frame. So your temporal resolution gets worse as you make your spatial resolution better. Fundamental trade-off in that MRI. So compressed sensing kind of acquisitions are a way to try to beat that trade-off. So instead of collecting a whole, all of the points in K-space, you, you collect a subset of the points in K-space. Most of the energy in Fourier transforms of things like patients is in the center of K-space. So we typically keep collecting the center of K-space samples over and over. Those are the ones that are shown in pink here. And then we would each frame collect a couple of the, some number, some smaller fraction of the higher frequency points. And we would vary those high frequency points from frame to frame to give us sampling to diversity, some form of incoherence or whatever conditions might be needed to, sam uh, to satisfy compressed sensing kind of theory or not satisfy the theory, but to work well in, in empirically. And so now you see if we take these six points and group them together, call that a frame, do some kind of reconstruction of that and take the next six points times. Now we have nominally the same spatial resolution because we've gone to the same limits, outer limits in K-space here, but we have better temporal resolution because it only took us six points collected to define one frame. But of course, each of these frames is really undersampled now, right? And this is just a one-dimensional illustration of the key idea in what we call KT space sampling. All right, so in this illustration, like I said, here we got better temporal resolution, but at the cost of undersampling, which we always have undersampling, so, but maybe worse undersampling now. As here, I have only six points per frame instead of back here where I had eight points per frame, so I had better sampling spatially then. So we're going to need fancy reconstruction algorithms to sort of fill in the gaps or to do matrix completion or however you want to think of it, to, to reconstruct a series of images from this incomplete data. All right, so yeah, pretty much everything I'm going to discuss applies to matrix completion problems as well. All right, so now I need to put some equations uh, to describe what I've just shown you in pictures. We've got a sequence of things that we're going to call frames. We still, I mean, I guess you could try to reconstruct an image at every one of these micro time points here where you have a ridiculous number of images and each one of them would be from incredibly undersampled data. So in practice, we group some number of these together and hope that there was not very much motion during that time interval. So that's what I'm in, in, in indexing by capital T here, the number of time slots that we break this data up into. So y, y sub one would be these set of six samples here, y sub d two, the next six, and so on. And x sub t, that denotes the latent image for the teeth frame that we're trying to reconstruct, which is typically 2D or 3D, depending on the kind of imaging we're doing. And then basically in MRI, you can say approximately the data is the Fourier transform of the object. So this a sub t is basically samples of the Fourier transform. Um, and typically what we do here is stack all the measurement data together to make a long vector Y. And then we take the latent images, vectorize them and lay them out next to each other in a matrix that's sometimes called the Kazerotic matrix or a space-time matrix. So this matrix has the number of pixels in each frame as the rows of the matrix, and then the number of time frames as the columns of the matrix. That's the thing that we'd like to reconstruct from this undersampled data. And we know what the, and so we, we, once we stack all that together, we can write a forward model Y equals A of X plus epsilon. A is a linear operator, it's not a matrix a linear operator because it's mapping a matrix into a vector. And virtually always in dynamic MRI, 
the number of measurement points we have is far less than the number of things that we would like to reconstruct. And so some kind of model assumption, dimensionality reduction, whatever you want to call it, regularization is essential. To, you can't just do ordinary least squares here because it's an underdetermined problem. Any questions about the setup? Yeah, I yeah, question. yeah. So in your sampling, you mentioned the well, like time delta. Yes. You can't speed that up, like. Um, yeah. Um, how? Yes. So we are collecting the samples as fast as we can. There are both physical limits of the patient and hardware limits of the scanner. Um, uh, so it's partly amplifier limits on the scanner, but even if we built more powerful amplifiers that could um, sort of swing these gradient fields at faster rates, uh, it, it can cause peripheral PNS, peripheral nerve stimulation that people don't like. And so there are limits, uh, re limits both hardware-wise and wetware-wise on what we can do on the, how fast we can sample per second, basically. That's a simplified version, but that's, there are ser serious limits there. And I should mention, of course, here, these are not point samples as well. There's also an ADD converter that's doing a little time integral, but so these really should be rectangles, not Dirac impulses like you'd see in a sampling theory textbook. You also have a question? That's a good question. Yeah. Maybe I don't know exactly how the MRI works, but each bunch of these points, if you do the reconstruction, they should be the same image of the human. Oh, so in dynamic MRI, we are interested in imaging things that are changing over time. For example, speech therapists are interested in seeing the vocal cords move. So you take uh, dynamic pictures of slices of the, of the head like this and look at the mouth and the tongue and all move. And people doing cardiac MRI, I had one of those recently myself, they're interested in how the heart is beating over time and so on. Uh, people who are doing, uh, worrying about ACL repairs or whatever, they actually have patients like move their knees in the scanner and they wanna see the, the, the muscles and whatever move together. So that's a few of many examples of where you're actually looking for things changing over time. One more example is where you inject something, a contrast agent, and then you look at the changes over time due to that injection. Um, but it's a great question. If the whole point, all of those examples I just described, there's some sort of correlation in the, in, in the information over time, right? If every frame was completely different, then there would be very, diff it would be very difficult to design like regularizers or models. But the fact that there is some opportunities for dimensionality reduction because of it is is the theme of this presentation really and all the work on trying to make up for the missing data in this problem so thank you for asking that's very relevant so with that in mind in fact i'm first going to oh yeah go ahead yeah uh, if you can go back to yeah. the last, so just a quick question do the indices in the case space, space space need to be at fixed points or ah uh, that's a, so what i'm illustrating here is what we call cartesian mri where they are spaced according to um, the, the discrete Fourier transform that go, you know, equally spaced, all right? But um, in two dimensions, we can do spirals and all sorts of other things as well. So they do, So this is great simplification of what really can be done in practice. But even when we do a spiral, we're moving around in two dimensional, let's say case space, every one of those points takes time, right? So time is marching on as we're collecting the points. So it's not limited to this. It's harder to reconstruct when they're not falling on an ice grid, but we do this that's an active area of research and has had some impact on clinical practice as well. Okay, so I'm gonna talk, so we gotta make some assumptions and a common assumption, the way it's worded in the literature as well, we're gonna assume that it's low rank. So we got this matrix that's space and time. If it's something like injecting a contrast, there'll be lots of pixels that are changing together in similar ways. So it makes sense that that matrix would be what we casually call low rank. It's not really low rank. What we really mean is if we plot the singular values of that matrix, there'll be some small number ones that are really large and a whole bunch of others that are small. We don't really mean that there's zero, okay? Even the absence of noise. I don't really believe in any real world applications. They're all zero, but it's, that's what we mean when we say low rank. And you should keep that in mind as you're thinking about the regularizers here. So, but if you want to take that idea of low rank to its extreme, you'd say, okay, I want to minimize that least squares cost function that goes with the assumption of Gaussian noise, which is perfectly reasonable in MRI, subject to a constraint that the rank of the latent image X, the latent image series X that you're trying to reconstruct is less than some constant K. That's an NPR problem to solve. So you can said, you could say, well, instead of constraint, I'll make it a regularizer. That's still a hard problem to solve because rank is a non-convex function, not impossible to make inroads on it, but it's challenging. Um, so, oh, and by the way, uh, let's see here. Uh, one more thing, especially for my former 553 students, if we didn't have this A matrix here, 
then this would just be some norm of X minus Y. And then we have closed form solutions to both of these problems that we teach in X551, right? Thanks to the Eckhart young mirkzi theorem. But it's, oh, and actually, I don't know if we talk about it in 551, but if A was unitary, we could use unitary invariance to move it to the other side and again, solve it with techniques that we discussed in 551. But it's not a unitary matrix in MRI. It's a wide matrix, because um, I said it's an undersampled problem. And as far as I know, there are no closed form solutions to either of these problems. So there's a big step up in complexity as soon as you go to non-unitary or non, well, identity is unitary, of course, non-unitary matrix uh, operators a here, okay. <clears throat> uh, I would say that you could call these, okay, I said it wouldn't be machine learning, but you could call these data-driven methods in the sense that in the process of reconstructing with these kind of regularizers, you're gonna end up using singular value decompositions and you're learning um, the basis functions, if you will, spatial and temporal in that reconstruction process from the data that's given to you. There's a PCA-like aspect to that, PCA with missing data, I guess, sort of. Um, but it's, I guess it's not, is it it's zero shot learning? You're learning it from the data at hand, not from a bunch of training data. Okay, so these are non convex problems. So, what's been done a lot in the literature is to replace the rank with a nuclear norm because that's a convex function, uh, or to assume that the latent image is a sum of a low rank part plus a sparse part. Uh, and there are lots of applications where you might think, okay, only a few of the pixels are changing or something. And so you could think about uh, a sparse component and reconstruct with a data fit term that again is basically AX minus Y, but then a nuclear norm for the part that you think is low rank and uh, some kind of one norm for the part that you think is sparse. Um, and there are lots of papers on solving these two optimization, optimization problems. I believe that the state-of-the-art method for solving these is something called proximal optimized gradient method. Uh, optimized gradient method was actually something my former student, Don Wan Kim, who's a professor at KAIST now, uh, developed. And then another group figured out how to apply that to um, composite cost functions. It's called a composite cost function because there's a smooth term and a non-smooth term that's prox friendly. Uh, and then Don Wan figured out how to add adaptive restart to that proximal optimized gradient method. And, and uh, we've applied this pre previously to MRI very successfully, as well as to other applications. And uh, I don't know if this is covered in 559, but I think it should be. Anyway, that's my bit. <laughs> it's covered when I teach it. But what, okay. is <laughs> what is ST? Ah, yes. So S is the sparse component and sparse oh, with okay. respect to what? Sparse with respect to typically some uh, transform that is often a temporal transform here. We think something might be a sum of a few sinusoids in time. So we might use a DCT kind of inverse DST, for DS, DCT, excuse me, for that matrix T, or we might think it's slowly varying in time, in which case T would be spatial, a finite difference in time. You could also have spatial sparsity as well and put a wavelet transform on the left or whatever. But so, so I really should probably have matrices on both sides of this in general. But that's, yeah, sorry, some sort of temporal sparsifying transform there. And it's on the right because the time is on the column index of this matrix S. So why do we assume an S here, sparsity? Um, in, well, it's, it's similar to robust PCA. You're assuming that the model has some low rank component and some sparse component and the uh, is not on the noise, like on the uh, That's line. correct, right. So the noise is this difference right here. So that is a different, I mean, in the, spark, in the robust PCA literature, you di have different formulations, some of which involve an equality constraint here. And there's, we don't want any equality constraint in MRI because there's definitely noise in the data. So the noise is here, the low rank is here, and this is sparse signal components that I'm interested in here. Uh, of course, there's a further extension that maybe you discussed in 559. If you thought there was outliers in the measurement process, maybe you'd replace this two norm with one norm, right? Or something like that. But at this point, Gaussian noise is a very reasonable model. Okay, that answer your question, I hope? Yeah. yeah. Um, so let me elaborate a little bit about the proximal gradient method, which, which is sort of a stepping stone to the proximal optimized gradient method. So we have what I've called a comp, what the literature calls, a composite cost function, a smooth term, and a non-smooth but prox-friendly term. Okay, there's the smooth term, the differentiable, the 
two norm squared. And then here, a nuclear norm is prox friendly, meaning we know how to solve the proximal operator for it. We even teach that in X551. And we also know the Lipschitz constant of the smooth term. And so the simplest sort of algorithm for solving this kind of composite cost function is proximal gradient method, also known as ISTA, where, which works out in this case to be you take a gradient descent where the great gradient step where the gradient is associated with the smooth term and uses the Lipschitz constant and the smooth term. And then you apply the proximal operator associated with the, pro the, uh, the non-smooth term, which is singular value soft thresholding in the case of the nuclear norm. So you do an SVD of the data and you shrink the singular values. Uh, some of them will end up being set to zero most likely. And then you reassemble it from the same left and right singular vectors. The only thing you've changed is the singular values. So that is a very simple algorithm to implement, but very uh, slow to converge. And so FISTA and proximal optimized gradient method are uh, accelerations of this that have momentum terms. I actually think I have, this is from Adrian Taylor's paper showing the proximal optimized method, optimized gradient method has the gradient step kind of term in it. Then it has this looks like long and complicated momentum term that came out of OGM. And then finally, there is a, um, the proximal mapping step where the sparsity or the low rank or whatever is enforced. Uh, and it took some work to come up with this. Uh, he actually, this is highlighting this is my highlights of this paper. We're saying just trying to take the original OGM and throw in a proximal step in the natural place didn't work. It took them a kind of computer assisted proof to figure out how to come up with this particular combination of factors here that gives you a convergent algorithm with a order one over K squared kind of convergence. Actually not, not just, it's got the optimal rate, including the constants. So that's why this is my favorite algorithm for this. And here's an example of this applied to what you could think of as a matrix sensing problem. It's a dynamic MRI reconstruction problem. So with a globally low rank plus sparse. And let's see, in green and purple are two augmented Lagrangian methods, ADMM type of algorithms that don't converge that quick. Very slow here is ISTA or the proximal gradient method. Here's FISTA in black stars. And then you can see the proximal optimized gradient method provides in significant with, uh, and this is with the adaptive restart, which I don't need to go into today, provides uh, quite a bit of additional acceleration. And so this is not new, that's been around for a few years now. Um, as a way of solving that relatively simple optimization problem involving a smooth term plus a nuclear, nuclear norm. Uh, let's see here, more examples of that. So I think I can skip this. So as a, any questions? Yeah, yeah, like, so yeah. I think the, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, optimization of a low rank matrix, like if you do a hard constraint is like the outer product of two matrices. Yes, that's right. Okay. Isn't that, uh, doesn't that have benign uh, non-convexity? I think it is probably benign. So I'm, I'm not exploring that in this work. I am, I am doing nuclear norms, but you could absolutely, that's another alternative formulation here is to use the Euro Montero, or however you say the names, factorization, like you said, but that has, that's biconvex, right? Which is not convex, but it's probably a more benign. So that's absolutely an alternative algorithm for this. If you know the rank, right? Or some bound on the rank so that you know what size to make those matrices. And that would be an interesting comparison. So when I say, I think this is a state of the art, I mean state of the art for this formula formulation. I'm not gonna claim, we have not done that comparison. I think that would be very interesting to do. Ah, but hold that thought when I get to locally low rank now, okay? So that's a great example of like, oh, I know how to solve this. And then let's see if it applies once I go to locally low rank. Right. Okay, so looking ahead, I'm gonna have lots and lots of these nuclear norm terms once I go to locally low rank and and it's not prox friendly, spoiler alert. So we're gonna need alternatives. And so let me remind you that the nuclear norm is a non-smooth function, right? This is something I've been doing X551. If you have a one by one matrix, the nuclear norm of that is the absolute value of the entrance of the element of that matrix. And that is a non-smooth function. And that's why I've been talking about ADMM and proximal methods instead of simple methods like conjugate gradient or, or quasi Newton methods. So let's remind ourselves that nobody told us in the first place we should be using a nuclear norm, right? We started out with an idea that the matrix is low rank, right? And we've already relaxed that to a nuclear norm. We, why not relax it further? Since no deity told us we have to use the nuclear norm. So what I'm gonna be investigating in the rest of this presentation is smooth regularizers where we replace 
the sum of the absolute, the sum of the singular values, the nuclear norm, with some smooth function of the singular values, such as this hyperbola shown in green here. And there's this exact formula for the hyperbola. Um, so it's a close approximation to the absolute value, but it's if you take if you take delta small enough, but it's differentiable, and that'll enable us to apply gradient-based methods. So I, so this is a talk where I'm starting with advanced methods and going back to simpler methods in a way, different methods that, all right. Uh, there's a few properties of this hyperbola and, and other functions in that class. There are Huber's conditions. It's symmetric, differentiable. The derivative of that function divided by its argument, which is a kind of weighting function, is bounded. And, it, and uh, the derivative of the function is also Lipschitz. So it's what we call a smooth function. Um, and if we use this kind of regularizer instead of the nuclear norm, now we can apply quasi-Newton and other gradient-based methods. Uh, and those, I think, have faster asymptotic rates than the, uh, the best methods for composite cost functions. So that's a potentially promising direction. Uh, in the long run, I actually think we want to move towards non-convexity again, but smooth non-convexity, something like this Cauchy function shown in magenta here, because those tend to give approximations that are um, that are better for low rank models uh, you know the we don't really want to shrink the large uh, singular value soft thresholding shrinks shrinks even the large singular values and if we replace that by something like rank or the smooth approximation to the indicator function I think we will induce less bias because we won't be shrinking the large singular values but I'm not that's just a foreshadowing of some future CSP seminar we haven't done that yet Okay, so this is the formula I'm talking about for the smooth regularizer right now for the globally low rank model. It's a couple properties of that. This function phi, C, excuse me, is convex, and it turns out the literature shows that it then means that the overall regularizer is convex. And this is not immediately obvious, right? Because you have the singular value function in the middle of this. It's not obvious to me or anything we teach in X551 that that combination there should lead to an overall convex function. But mathematicians have worked that out a while ago. They've also worked out what the gradient of this function is. So you start out with taking the SVD of the argument X, and it turns out the gradient of this function is given by, uses the same singular components on the left and right, and then it has a diagonal matrix involving the derivative of that, I call it the potential function, this uh, smooth function C in the middle here, uh, evaluated at all the singular values, and I'm using the Julian notation here. So this dot in this numer up above, upstairs, that's the derivative. The dot downstairs, that's Julia telling, it, telling to apply the function element-wise to the arguments in a vector. Okay, a little bit like dot times in MATLAB, but applied to other functions. All right, so that's been known for at least whatever that is, a long time, 30 years or something, um, that that's the formula for the gradient. And we, Rodrigo has worked out that you can actually get the Lipschitz constant of the gradient this cost function, which you would want for step sizes in a gradient-based method. And it turns out to simplify to simply be the second derivative of that potential function, C, the, the hyperbola or whatever, uh, building on some existing literature from about 20 years ago. All right, so we have a smooth function here. We can apply gradient-based methods. Let's put the pieces together then. So my overall cost function has got the data fit term that comes from the physics of MRI, plus this regularizer that has some smooth functions of the singular values. Um, putting the pieces together, this is the formula for the gradient then. Uh, we've got the gradient of the smooth term plus the gradient of the regularizer. And... Uh, I'm probably going to want to do some kind of line search in the process of optimizing this non-quadratic but smooth cost function. So to, to solve a line search, I need a direction. I'm going to get the direction, of course, from the gradient. And then we need to figure out how far to step in that direction. And so there's a one-dimensional optimization problem to solve, and it has this form given right here. And it turns out we have shown, here we go again, sitting right in the front row, that that is a smooth function. That part is maybe obvious. It takes a little more work to work out that the Lipschitz constant of that one-dimensional function is given by this scalar right here. All things that we know that are easy to compute. Um, so that's useful, I think, for choosing step sizes or initial step sizes in something like a quasi-Newton method. All right, so with that in mind, we have actually implement it, we now meaning Rodrigo, uh, uh, meaning uh, Javier, I don't know if he's here or not, but, um, and I gave this at the SIAM conference, when was it, last spring, and he was emailing me some of these results like the week before, it was 
very exciting at the time. All right, so um, what I'm comparing here is the proximal optimized gradient method versus LBFGS, a uh, bunch of offers names. This is a quasi-Newton method. Roy, I don't remember all their names. Okay, classic quasi-Newton method. Um, I'm actually evaluating the non-smooth cost function on the left, right? Let's assume you really want to solve that new nuclear norm regularized cost function, so that's non-smooth. Let's go ahead and apply the optimized gradient, excuse me, the proximal optimized gradient method to it, POGM. And then let's also run this quasi-Newton method for the approximate, you can call it if you want, approximate cost function where we've rounded the corner, but to make it apples apples, I'm go ahead and plot them. And you can see that if, despite the fact this is minimizing a slightly different cost function, at least on the scale of looking at here in terms of the cost function, it, they look virtually the same. Since it's a smooth function, we can also apply the original optimized gradient method and it's pretty good, but not quite as fast. So don't focus on the green curves as much. Um, now, from a practical point of view, I don't really care about minimizing the cost function. I care about the quality of the images that come out of it. And so here, this is a setting where we know the ground truth, so I can, can compute the normalized root mean squared error to the ground truth. And you can see that both the proximal gradient method and the quasi-Newton method are converging at about the same rate, about 20 iterations to the lowest no, uh, normalized root mean squared error we can get. Um, you might be curious to what happens to the uh, singular values in this case. So first of all, the real data itself, the ground truth, these are its singular values. This is the thing we're calling low rank. All right, now the ground truth here is actually noisy data from a patient, fully sampled noisy data. So there's noise in this and that's why you're seeing, but you can see this is on a log scale. So on a log scale, there's a few singular values that dominate and then a whole bunch that I'm sure is pretty much just noise. And the uh, proximal optimized gradient method or any method that's using the nuclear norm is going to shrink a lot of those singular values towards zero. If we ran more iterations, I assume some of these blue dots would get closer and closer to zero. Um, when we use this kind of rounding the corner, we don't get as much shrinkage, right? So the the, the blue, and it depends on the regularization parameter, right? If I use a larger round of the corner, then it shrinks it somewhat. If I use a smaller that's the orange one here. You can see it shrinks it almost, almost as much as using the nuclear norm itself. Let's see here. And there's images that go with this. We get basically the same normalized root mean squared error. You'd be hard pressed, I'm sure, to see any differences between these two images. Just to give you a sense, this is the ground truth here. Uh, well, one frame out of a 40, uh, well, 30 some, I forget exactly, 30 or 40 frame time series. Um, if I just take the undersampled case based data and do an inverse FFT where I stick in zeros for all the missing data, you get this horrible image here, right? So um, this is a seriously underdetermined problem. We need to integrate or, or consider information across time, which the methods on the top row are doing, and you get very similar images, whether or not you use the nuclear norm or a rounded corner version of the nuclear norm. Any questions about the global low rank before I move on to the locally low rank? Yeah, so yeah. the POGM is solving the nuclear norm. That's well, correct. LBFGS is solving the... The smooth approximation, that's exactly right. And despite that, and despite, and this is the nuclear norm version of the cost function, the cost function looks virtually identical. Uh, you had a question? Yeah. On the second slide. The next slide, the picture slide? Yeah, okay, yeah. More practical questions. Yeah, practical questions are good. So technically, when you do them, right, like to... The doctor will come and see is there some sort of like a low bar error where like ah uh, yeah have this error and then the yeah. patient wouldn't see the difference. In case the people on Zoom can't hear the question is is there some you know how how good does this need to be, and the answer is it's not a new uh, not a normalized root mean square error metric right you're trying to detect whatever some form of cardiac disease or whatever it's a complicated task they're doing, and the field there are people who work on that but I would say the field does not have good sort of quantitative metrics that relate directly to those kinds of complicated tasks that doctor are doing. So the real answer is something way more complicated than, oh, we need a normalized root mean squared error of 9% to be good enough. And I'd say that's an open problem in the field. There are people working on it, but there's a long way to go. And if we knew that, if we had good models for doing that, when we train neural networks, we wouldn't use L2 loss or whatever. We would use the loss associated with the task that a doctor is trying to do. And there's lots of different tasks too. But it would be nice if there were some concrete tasks that we had quantitative metrics for assessing from the images 
in the field is, especially in dynamic imaging, we're not there yet, I think. Great question though. So yeah. this is a high quality image and you undersampled it, right? We retrospectively undersampled it, right. If, if it's a <laughs> quality image based on your diagram, you would have needed to take very few like time samples. This would be like still image. So how did you simulate the time step? Yeah, so th this is a lie. This is where we, we've taken 128 by 128 samples and pretended that they all were acquired at the same point in time and reconstructed them and made this frame. And then there's 40 of those. And then we retrospectively undersampled parts of that, uh, of, the, of the case base. So we're accounting for the undersampling from time frame to time frame, but in this kind of simulation, which is ubiquitous in the field, does not account for the real world, that the fact that the thing is changing over time as those samples were acquired. But this is what doctors are used to lo uh, looking at. So I'm sure there are some, some blur or whatever in this image because of the amount of time it took. And I actually don't know how long that I'd have to go look to see how long did it actually take. I mean, our heart beats about once a second, right? So even if this only took a tenth of a second, there's motion in that tech tenth of a second. Um, so if you want to submit this kind of work to a real MRI meeting, not just a signal processing journal, you have to do what's called a perspective study, where you go in the scanner and you collect the fewer samples um, so that the time is really reflective of how you would use the undersampled data in practice. This kind of retrospective analysis is great for method development, but not convincing to a doctor or not even to other MRI physicists. That's a starting point. It's good, for, okay for CSP seminar or a SIAM optimization conference presentation. Yes, go ahead, Rex. Question on the last slide. Okay, the previous slide. Yeah. Uh -huh. For the last plot, how many iterations was it? I don't remember, um, and Javier's not here, so <laughs> I would have to ask <laughs> the graduate student that I don't know. Um, and that would be a fair, uh, oh, actually, wait a minute. No, 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 uh, um, I would just, it's either 30 or somewhere down in this, you know, once it's sort of prat somewhere between 20 and 30. I'm confident of that. Okay. But I don't know the exact number. Yeah, Utah. So what's the motivation to smooth the nuclear norm? So okay. You can plug in different solvers. Right. So that's, so save that thought. The, the, this next section is the real motivation for this. So let me get to that now. So, um, Assuming the entire time sequence is globally low rank is probably not as realistic assumption as assuming that patches of that image viewed over time uh, are low rank, right? Because what I don't, I don't, you can think of lots of reasons why different places in the image that are far apart from each other are not necessarily going to be, behave in the same way, but pick, pixels that are near each other over time, you could imagine um, behaving more similarly. So I would say this kind of model is actually more popular in MRI these days, aside once you put, except for machine learning, um, where you don't assume the entire image is low rank, but you extract patches. So remember we have, an, we have an image over time, I restraped it. Okay, this is my, my image here is whatever that is, eight by eight by time. Instead of assuming that the matrix, let's say there's 40 time frames. So this would be a 64 by, uh, 40 matrix, instead of assuming that whole thing is low rank, let's take a, in this case, four by four patch out of it. So now that's a 16 pixels over time. Assume that matrix is low rank. I mean, if I make the patches small enough, then of course it'll be low rank because I don't have any pixels in it. But um, <clears throat> so uh, this is a very popular thing. And there are even matrix completion methods that people have worked on that also use a low rank model. You could imagine if Netflix arrange their movie and ratings matrix such they put all the dramas together and all the action films together, that matrix might also be locally low rank, more locally low rank than it is globally low rank, right? So you, you can think of applications beyond just dynamic MRI where this might be a reasonable thing to do. Um, yeah, so in fact, I list this has been used in lots of areas of different kind of MRI as well as even some matrix approximation applications. All right, so this is a harder problem now because of the sum. Uh, and there's a question of how you set up these patches. In the picture here, I've done what would be called non-overlapping patches, right? There's four different patches here. They don't overlap. And if you do it that way, this is, a this is still, despite the sum here, this is still a prox-friendly fr function. And you can work the proximal operator for it is simply to take the SVD of each patch and then do the singular value um, soft thresholding of each of the singular values for each patch and put the patches back together. All right, but in practice that leads to images with blocky artifacts. I'll show you an example in a second. So what we'd really like to use is non-overlap, uh, is overlapping patches. 
so that the problem becomes shift invariant. One way to do that is write this with a separate sum here, a sum over all possible translations of the image, building that shift in there, and then extracting patches from the shifted versions. And if you think about this long enough, this is a now shift, circularly shift. In, if you do circular shifts, this is a circularly shift invariant function. Unfortunately, so it has the benefit of that shift invariance, which eliminates block and artifacts, but there is no proximal operator for that. If you can think of one, let me know what it is, but I don't think it exists. I think that overlapping the patches makes it extremely, I think it makes it impossible to work out analytically what the um, proximal operator is it for it. So what, so now you have to make some choices. And so the choices that I'm aware of at the moment, you could use subgrading descent. So randomly pick a shift every iteration. This is closely related to what's called cycle spinning in um, um, wavelet denoising methods or whatever, closely related to stochastic proximal gradients methods. All right, and then there's questions about convergence of that. You could do proximal operator, uh, uh, proximal averaging. Without this extra sum, we know the proximal operator. We could pretend that the prox of a sum is the sum of the proxes. That's not true, but we could pretend it is or sort of make that as approximation uh, and then apply separately the proximal operation to all each of the possible shifts and then just add them or average them together. That's been done in the literature. Again, you don't know what the convergence properties are. Or you could introduce ADMM or let me see, what was the suggestion? Oh, the factorization approach. Okay. Um, so now if we do the, the Bureau Montenero factorization here, we'd have a lot of factors because we have all these different patches. So we'd have an enormous number of variables. And the same is true with any kind of splitting based method, augmented Lagrangian method. The, the number of auxiliary variables you need with, especially with a stride of one with these overlapping patches would be gigantic. Uh, so we don't think those are viable. And so this is the real motivation for considering smooth approximations to the nuclear norm. But before I get there, let me just show you an example of what happens if we were to use non-overlapping patches. All right. So in a non-overlapping case, it's prox friendly. So I can apply POGM with a couple different regularization parameters, get some cost functions and some normalized root mean squared errors. And if you look at the images, I hope that you can see even from the back of the room, you see this sort of checkerboard like effect in here. And that's coming from, I guess we probably used, I'm gonna guess that is eight by eight or 16 by 16 patches there. And you can really see the boundaries between those patches. You can even see it in the air images here. So that is why people don't wanna use proximal, uh, non um, locally low rank with non-overlapping patches. We really need the overlap. So you could try some of these, I'm gonna call them ad hoc modif modifications over here, like the choosing one shift at random every iteration, or the one I'm gonna focus on here is where you do the, you pretend the sum of the prox is the, the prox of the sum, which is called proximal averaging. And it actually works surprisingly well or interestingly well. So uh, the cost function goes down here. We don't know if it's converging to a, this is a convex cost function. We do not know if it's converging to a, a global minimizer of that convex cost function. In fact, if we zoom in on this plot of the cost function, you can see that there's oscillations going on here when we do the cycle spinning version. Um, the, the one with the averaging doesn't show those, op, uh, those oscillations, but we have no idea if this is the minimum of the cost function. Um, so that's one option, and I, this, but I have to admit it worked better than we thought it did, when, or I thought it would when we first started investigating this. And it makes images with a decent quality, 13.7% in RMSE. If you remember back to the globally low, low rank, the best I had there was like 14.4%, right? So we're moving in the right direction here, getting a lower normalized root mean squared error but with an algorithm that we don't know anything about its convergence properties, or I don't know anything about it anyway. So to make something that we're confident about convergence, let's replace the nuclear norm with the smooth approximation. This is the real motivation for all this work. Um, because now we can have as many patches as we want, overlapping or not, it doesn't matter. It's just a big sum. Every one of the terms is smooth. And all the previous theory applies. You can work out what the gradient of is. The gradients can involve the derivatives of, the, of this potential function applied element-wise to the singular values of the matrix formed from each of those patches. Um, so there's a lot of, SV, a lot of little SVDs to do here. All right. You can also work out what the Lipschitz constant is. 
uh, which is helpful for the line search step. Um, and so now you see why I introduced the global. It's just, it's just messier because of the sum over the patches here, but this is really what we're interested in. Now, we, when we round the corner, there is going to be trade-offs, right? Uh, and so this is an illustration of how the normalized root mean squared error is affected by the choice of how much we round the corner, right? So there's this delta that needs to be chosen. If we choose delta really small, then we get a very good approximation to the absolute value function. But the curvature at the bottom of that approximation is very high, which means, let's see, if you look at somewhere in this formula, um, yeah, this, this curvature function here will get large as delta gets small. And so we'll have larger Lipschitz constants, which tends to lead to slower convergence. And that's what we see here. So very small value of delta. I mean, it is going down and it's probably gonna eventually reach the similar level of normalized root mean squared errors. These We should run this more iterations to see, but it's going at a slower rate. Whereas if we use a little bit bigger value of delta, then the curvature is not so large. The algorithm takes larger, larger steps and we get faster convergence. That's what's shown in the blue here. This is the Goldilocks one, the one that's in blue. If we use a really large value of delta, well, then we get reasonably fast, that's the magenta curve here, we get reasonably fast convergence initially, but we're not getting enough shrinkage of the small singular values, and we end up with an unnecessarily large normalized root mean squared error. You can see it plateaus here at whatever that is, 20 some percent, which is not good results. So we do need shrinkage here, right? We want the dimensionality reduction, um, but our approximate dimensionality reduction. So there's, in practice, to use this, there would be some empirical tuning needed to play around with that, that parameter. Let me just be honest about that. Um, and we've applied it to that cardiac data set that I showed you a little bit ago. And um, here again, I'm showing the non-smooth cost function and running LB, LBFGS, the quasi-Newton method, with a reasonable value of delta. And also I'm running proximal optimized gradient method with the proximal averaging. So this one we know converges. And in fact, we know it converges to a minimizer, a global minimizer of that convex cost function. This one, we don't know what it does, but you can see at least as we look at the cost function, it's going down to, well, it looks like almost, but not exactly the same value. Now I look at it closely, it looks to me like the stars are a little bit above. So it's actually reaching a, I don't know, a stationary point or something that is not quite as low in the, in its own cost function, actually. That's interesting, okay. Um, this is a very vanilla implementation of LBGF. I don't know if you guys talk about quasi-Newton in um, 559 or not, but you start out with a typically a diagonal approximation to the Hessian, and then you build up rank one approximation uh, additions to that. And the standard things do is just start out with the identity matrix, but you usually want a constant there. And I don't think we've built that constant in here yet to, to get a better or even better diagonal approximation. So I think we can further accelerate the, um, the rate of convergence of this quasi-Newton method. And you can see in terms of the final inequality here, they're all reaching similar uh, final image quality uh, as measured by normalized root mean squared error. All right. Um, 13.9% or whatever, but again, that does not relate to a clinical task. Let me just acknowledge that. <clears throat> All right, so to summarize, um, I hope I've persuaded you that we can use a smooth approximation of the nuclear norm that gives us very similar results in the context to a nuclear norm in the context of dynamic image reconstruction. The fact that we have Lipschitz constants for this it lets us use uh, convex optimization methods where we're confident about the convergence properties. But I have to acknowledge that the sort of ad hoc things that you can do with POGM, like cycle spinning or proximal averaging, remarks, works remarkably well. Maybe And maybe some clever student here can, or colleague can work out some convergence theory for that that would put it on more solid theoretical footing. Everything I've shown you here today has been for the convex case. I'm interested in a non-convex case in the future because I think we'll get better quality results. The way I would do that was would be with graduated non-convexity. I'd start out with a hyper, hyperbola and then relax, I don't know if relax is the right word, but evolve it towards the cauchy light function to try to get a good, not necessarily optimal, but a good local minimizer. Uh, there's another version of regularizer that just uses the tail of the singular values. And the tail of the singular values is also a non-convex function. And it's also a non-smooth function, but if we put that Hoover-like function there, we can make it 
a non-convex but smooth function. And this really makes a lot of sense. If you have a rough idea, if you think, okay, I've injected contrast, I think there's gray matter and white matter in the brain, so I'm expecting the rank to be on the order of two. Why bother putting any regularizer at all on the first two singular values? Maybe we should just regularize the remaining singular values. And so that's something we'll be exploring in the future. And then I think there's a number of ideas we can exploit to further reduce the computation time for this. And with that, I will say thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Thanks for our Professor Jeff Bessner to this great impressive talk. So for now, we can get into the question and answering. Is there any question from the audience? Yes. Okay. So you, you, you mostly uh, focused on algorithmically solving this problem, but for nuclear norm, we, if we assume we can solve the problem, we have some guarantees on recovering the low rank solution. When you do this smoothing, and if you uh, assume you can solve the problem for global optimality, do we still have those type of guarantees? Yeah, so do we have guarantees uh, if, let me see here. If A is the identity matrix, I agree there's guarantees, right? I'm not sure that for a general sensing matrix here, I don't know the compressed sensing literature well enough to know what kind of guarantees, or maybe I should go to this version right here, the one of the nuclear norm. I actually don't know what the guarantees are in that case, right? There's probably some conditions on the matrix A, the RIP kind of things or whatever that probably don't are not held, don't actually hold in my application. So, I mean, it's a great question. You could still, have, yeah, so that, um, Ah, but I bet those guarantees start out with the assumption, and some of you, Clay, probably know, you both probably know better than I do. Lots of you probably know better than I do. They probably start out assuming the matrix is actually low rank. And I don't actually believe my matrix is truly low rank, right? I believe it has a few small, large singular values and a whole bunch of smaller singular values. So I think there's a big gap between that theory and what actually is relevant to me in practice. But I think it's still an interesting academic question. And my guess is the answer is the, the guarantees are probably lost because, you know, with the, with the nuclear norm, you have the, the singular value soft thresholding function that is exactly zero here and then it's whatever out here, right? Once you round the corner, you get something that probably looks more like, I, I say probably, but I really know. It looks something more, it's, it's zero here, but it's small here. It's never zero. And so I doubt, well, we'd have to define the nature of those guarantees to accept smallness as opposed to getting exactly zero for these. That's my guess, but I'm not an expert in all that literature because I tend to think there's a gap between that literature and my real world problem. But it's a great question, but Vladimir, yeah? Yeah, uh, I have a question on the application side. I'm just yeah. curious. What's the meaning of a violation of the run constraint in the MRI application? What does it mean for a patient? Um, Can you miss something on MRI? Ah, oh yeah, so yeah, that's... Um, Some kind of physical like, um, violation for violation. What would it mean? Yeah, so the question is for Zoom is, what, is, what would the mean, meaning of a, a violation of the rank constraint? So, um, yeah, so I'll answer it this way. If we put the regularization parameter too large or set the constraint on the rank too small, um, I think you could end up making two tissues that are that should be looking different over time, gray matter and white matter, whatever, looking the same, and then you could miss, or maybe instead of gray matter and white matter, well, uh, normal brain matter and some lesion that's for some reason behaves differently over time, you might end up forcing it to fit, you know, as a linear combination of the low rank basis that you've ended up here that makes it look normal. This is absolutely a concern. And if, if that's happening, then that means you need to back off on how aggressively you're undersampling here, right? I mean, there's how aggressively we undersample it is, involves this trade-off between spatial resolution and temporal resolution. And I think the field is still figuring that out. But if we don't know how aggressively we can undersample here, but if I, I can guarantee you, if we undersample too aggressively, at some point we will lose the distinction between abnormal and normal tissue. And then we need to back off from that. Um, and I feel like we'll have a better chance of figuring that out in this convex setting than we ever will with black box deep networks. But that's a whole other discussion, right? We, we, we need to figure out those limits for those kind of methods as well. It's a great question. Yeah. Um, so there are some classes, I, I think there's some classes of uh, proximal operators that can be, or where the sum it of could proximals be. is the mm -hmm. proximal of, not, well, not the proximal of the sum, but you can yeah. compose 
proximal operators. In certain ways, I think they're called summative proximal. Okay, and I don't know about, okay, all right. And you said compose, but you really mean add here, right? I'm adding I'm adding terms together here, well, not, the, not this, composing. The su summative proximal operators, I think you have to compose them in a certain way. I don't uh, know okay. it's always addition. Uh, okay, I see. I'd love to know more about that. I'm confident, pretty confident this one is not prox friendly, but I would okay. love to be proven wrong because then we could use it directly, absolutely. Yeah, right. Back to the sampling illustration. Yeah, okay. How can we be sure that we're sampling fast enough even at the highest sampling rate? <laughs> How can we be sure we're sampling fast enough? Um, I mean, I guess fortunately we know a lot about the body, right? We know that the heart beats about once a second and we know when we inject contrast agent, there's been enough studies that we know, um, you know, the typical time constants of tissue and so on. And maybe I should, uh, what we what we often do, I, I've talked about the trade-off between spatial resolution and temporal resolution, but there's another trade-off involved in this, which is volume coverage. If I'm willing to look at just one slice of the brain, then I can get a decent trade-off between spatial resolution and temporal resolution. But if I want to look at the whole brain, then it takes more time, right? So I think for answering a question like, how do we know if it's fast enough, we can do things like study just part of the body and see what the time constants are. And then from that, get a sense of like, okay, what time, what temporal resolution do we need when we're trying to image the whole brain or the whole heart or whatever, or the, or the whole gut as <laughs> is paying the bills for some of us right now. So, uh, I mean, that's a very qualitative answer to your question, but I think the fact that we can look at limited field of views can help us answer that question. Because I'm just trying yeah, to think yeah. back to like basic signal processing, like, is there a notion of a Nyquist ray? Yeah, right. Um, well, in a sense, there is. The heart beats about once a second, but it's not a sinusoid, right? The way it beats is it's sort of we spend more time in is it diastole or then systole. I can't remember. There's, you know, in, in contraction, then I can't remember, right? And so there's harmonics of that. And I'm sure it's not strictly band limited, right? In the same way I've said nothing here is strictly low rank, but the amplitudes of the harmonics are going to drop off, right? The dominant one. And so, you know, it's at some point it becomes maybe irrelevant for diagnosis or whatever. And so I think we can study those waveforms and figure out, okay, what, so there is, so yes, I think there's an approximate notion of a band limit there. This is good enough, right? And we have that in fMRI as well, right? We know what are sort of the physiological noise fluctuations that come from the heart and breathing and how fast do we need to sample in order not to alias, not to alias too much of that. It's a great question. I, I don't remember who's next, but I'll go with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question on the local, low rank. Okay. Just so if the patches have different ranks. Yes, uh -huh. so, yeah. So, uh, would it be great to like deal with, uh, like, consider the high parameter like delta and yeah. different patches? Yeah. The question is if the patches have different rank. I mean that, so, um, one of the reasons I prefer this kind of regularizer formulation compared to the constraint formulation, let me go back to the globally low rank for one for a moment here, right? If I, uh, if, if you think some of you may be aware of the um, KSVD method, right? And the KSVD method, you have to choose a K and it's equivalent to kind of like, it's, a, it's kind of equivalent to this kind of constraint. And in imaging, I generally don't think that the different patches of the image should have the same K, right? Because there's going to be some with more complexity and some with others, right? So when I, instead of putting this kind of constraint for every patch, when I add them all up in this sum that I've shown you when I go back to my here, I'm not saying any one patch has to be low rank. I'm saying the sum of the nuclear norms of all of them should be small and how small depends on this regularization parameter beta. And so that gives different patches the opportunity to, some of them can have a larger set of singular values and other have smaller. And so I'd like to hope that the, the question you're asking is built into the fact that I've made this a sum rather than a patchwise constraint. I should prove that to you. I should actually do some reconstructions and show you that the ranks actually vary from patch to patch. I'm confident they will. Um, and I think that's a desirable property of looking at this in aggregate rather than putting a constraint on each patch. I'm really glad you asked that. Thanks for that. Good. Some, some of positive things usually uh, imply sparsity. Okay, yeah, exactly. This is kind of a one norm of nuclear norms, yeah. right? And yeah. so so you get that exactly. I think that's likely to happen. Yeah. Uh, also, both uh, local low rank. 
no, I think you are like put fix of patricides, then can the whole possible. Yeah, yeah, okay. Would it be beneficial to partition in English? Yeah. That's a great idea. In fact, there is some work where they use people use what they call anatomical patches or whatever, right? Like you could maybe before you inject the contrast agent, you could collect a static image and sort of then segment the image into different regions and then use sort of those tissue dependent instead of just a grid like this. Um, you know, there's more more kind of a lot of details to figure out how to implement that, but I think Oh, and uh, and I actually think some of the work um, like Becca Willett and Rob Nowak have done for wavelet kind of models, and Clay's not here. Um, um, I think they've considered these dyadic decompositions that don't just have one patch size, but have different, you know, sort of powers of two of different patch sizes. So absolutely, there's lots of extensions like that you could consider here. That's a really interesting idea. Can you just follow yeah. the question? So like the size of the patch or the overlap region of the patch, do you have like any... Uh, <laughs> go ahead, keep <laughs> yeah, so The answer is no, but go ahead and finish yeah, your question. Exactly. <laughs> so just saying this kind of, uh, you know, implementation details, but also change what maybe the low rank assumption here for the way that we right. can do regradation. Yeah, so I mean, the free parameters here are this regularization parameter, the patch size, and well, in the corner rounding of the nuclear norm, I think those are the... Well, and then the choice of stride if we go to non-overlapping yeah. patches. And we've done no theory, not even any experimentation really on that yet. Um, great question, and and I don't have any answers. That's why I started to say no before I even <laughs> finished your question. Um, it's, yeah, those, it's a little more engineering. It's kind of, I mean, yeah. The number of parameters there is minuscule compared to the number of free parameters in a deep learning method, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm okay with it. Sorry, people are also you know, trying to say like, oh, what size of the convolution kernel? Right, yeah, yeah so exactly. And what's the stride, you know, right. the, yeah. like the different shape of the yeah, kernel. I think yeah, this is very interesting. It looks like a very systematic and schematic uh, thing that we can do with the lower. If there's yeah, if there's anything from that literature that would help us choose those things here, I'd be interested to know about it. I mean, there's trade-offs. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so your model only concerned about the Gaussian noise. Mm -hmm. The MRI uh, is a high Anderson frequency. So also have the Anderson frequency. Ah. So when you talk about undersampling noise, that's you're talking about taking the adjoint of A and applying it to Y and reconstructing an image. That image absolutely would have aliasing artifacts and all sorts of complicated noise. But the noise in the raw data itself is Gaussian noise. There's no undersampling noise in the raw data. When you're talking about you're talking about taking an undersampled spiral spiral and doing a zero filter, you know, adjoint reconstruction of that. So it, it's absolutely a Excellent uh, approximation here. The dominant source of noise is, in case you guys are curious, uh, we have these received coils next to the body. In the body are all our spins, our hydrogen atoms uh, fluctuating around, and they are a source of thermal noise that the coil picks up. And you've got central limit theorem on steroids there, really, you know, uncountable number of, well, okay, very large number of th spins um, um, producing a signal in the coil. Uh, and but see, you're talking about something different. You're talking about after some data processing, but I'm not. This is the raw data, no processing over here. Okay. All right, Jaya. So for the dynamic MI, so my first question is that locally low rank will capture more dynamic things or motions than the global rank. Uh, I'm going to be careful about motion because motion is tricky because then things are moving from patch to patch. So coming back to you, I think. Uh, in the presence of motion, we might want to think about more complicated models where the patches are sort of moving across time, right? This cardiac perfusion data set, I think, has no motion in it. It's just, it's it's cardiac gated, right? So you, you capture the heart at the same phase in the cardiac cycle, but you, there's an injected contrast agent, you can see it in the, in the whatever this is, the atrium or whatever, that's changing intensity over time. So I... Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. that if just changing the intensity over the time, clearly, like, ideally, one from the rank one. If, if all the pixels are changing the same way over time, that's right. And but it could be that the one the pixels in the atrium are are different than the ones in the ventricle or whatever. So you could imagine yeah. a small rank right there. But in the presence of motion, I think it is more complicated. And if that's what you're getting at, I totally agree. Yeah. Okay. 
hey, I'm not even sure that a locally low rank model with fixed patches is, is necessarily, but people have used it for motion, I think. But I think there's definitely opportunities to improve that. You said that was your first question. You had another one? Yeah. <laughs> so that follow up is what kind of dynamic thing is better to capture in this in this local low rank and what like uh, what uh what kind of dynamic thing is hard to capture in your yeah, I think you already answered that question yourself with your question. My guess is that motion is harder and that uh, contrast changes are easier. That's just my intuition. I don't have proof or anything of that. But um, uh, Rodrigo, do you have any thoughts about that? Rodrigo is actually going to work on this for gut imaging, right? Which is going to have motion. It depends on how drastic your motion. Yeah, I think that's right. It's the same. It depends on how drastic the motion is, and I would agree with that. And get back to the assumption about like sparsity after the temporal transformation. Okay, which I only use for one illustration, just so yeah, you know, the rest yeah, of it was, yeah, okay, yeah, about, okay, yeah. You think in that part, we need to, uh, for example, have some like periodic regarding the motion? The ah, um, well, oh yeah, yeah. The, if we use something like the discrete Kostrand transform, that's typically used in a setting where you, like a cardiac, where you do have some kind of periodicity of the motion so that you expect it to be sparse in the Fourier basis, yeah, right? Yeah. If you don't have that kind of periodicity, then you should probably use some other, yeah, something, some other temporal transformation, right? So absolutely, we should tailor that sparsifying transform to the kind of temporal dynamics we expect to have. Yep, mm -hmm. and people do that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, for, if we Scott, have, right? Yeah. Hi, Scott. Scott. <laughs> Even for overlapping stitches, would yeah. be reasonable reasonable to add factor regularization based on the overlapping area? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean. I mean, uh, when we have overlapping patches, every pixel is appearing in more than one patch, and the, their effects all just get added up. I'm not quite sure how to what you mean by consider the overlap. I mean, it's already in there, but you probably have something more complicated in mind. I'm not sure what it is, though. Uh, so if two patches, they have the shared columns. Well, yes. The split from the original images. We want a reconstruction of uh, two patches. The so value of maybe the shared column to be matches to just such a... OK, I, I think I get what you're saying. Yes, you're, you're imagining if I extract some overlapping patch here, how am I going to put the pieces together yeah. back at the end? So. This is my cost function here, and that cost function involves terms that overlap with each other. When I compute the gradient of that cost function, which is on an upcoming slide here, I think. Oh, should be. Didn't we have the gradient in these? Um, the gradient here involves, yes, okay. The gradient involves both extracting the patch and taking the SVD of the patch time matrix and then the gradient also involves the adjoint of the patch extraction operator. That's the part that reassembles it. And I'm not like inventing some algorithm for how do I put it together. This is coming from the math. It's coming from the formula for the gradient of this cost function. So, so it's there hidden, but it's not like something we had to sit there and think about, like what's the best subroutine to write for this? It, the math tells us. Yeah, hi. So um, how do you know what the linear operator should be? I mean, you, ah. you can have a physics-based model for what it could be, but you know, in real life, your coils have some sort of difference in like natural directivity. And yep, yep, yep. Like that. So how do you know what it, it should be? Yep. So there's all sorts of calibration things that go on in MRI scans to measure those things. So there's typically a number of different physics-based ingredients that go into these matrices A and uh, so the coil sensitivity is one of them. So there's typically a pre-scan that we get, you know, that that we uh, learn that information from. If it turns out the readouts are long, like in a spiral, then the the magnetic field and homogeneity, the B0 field matters. And so we need a separate scan for that. I mean, we could try to also reconstruct those things jointly and set up a really big, you know, holy grail cost function. But at this point, typically we measure those things separately and build them into our model for A. So saying it samples the Fourier transform is the textbook version that's easiest described in a signal processing audience. But in an MRI audience, we would get into more all those details that have to be um incorporated in that matrix a and they're always imperfect right because we're learning them from or measuring them from calibration scans but they work pretty well i mean are we yeah there's pretty well-known ways how to get those 
Yeah, I think yeah, the air was probably. Is. Maybe yeah. we can check if there is any questions. Uh, I, I have been monitoring and I don't see any questions on Zoom. Oh. There's okay. yes. that one is from earlier. Let's see here. That is, <laughs> I'll bring it up just so you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I see that already on my laptop, so I think that's an excellent place to end, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so let's thank Professor Jeff uh, Fisler again for this kind of very impressive and great talk. And thank you so much for right. helping us learning so much about the optimization and also the reconstruction. This thank you all for your great questions. I really appreciate the interactivity that we have a tradition of here. So I appreciate yeah. that. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.